and we have returned. We're going to talk some little bit, some more about some a little bit of more. I don't know English. I'm not from here. Anyway, I am. We're going to talk a little more about substance use, and now we're going to talk about specifically models. Hey, hello. There we go. We're back. Uh, I changed the title of this to be Models and Interventions. So specifically one model, uh, a fairly uh, successful model called, I'll show you in a minute, and some different, some information about interventions and their effectiveness and how those things kind of work. So let's get on with the business. So Models and Interventions. The model, the only one we're going to talk about in this lecture is Cher's Biopsychosocial Model. You're just going to have to get used to words like that if you're going to do anything psychological or public health related or even a lot of medical stuff because psychosocial, biopsychosocial, yeah, we just cram all those words together. Um, so Cher's biopsychosocial model, and there is a reasonable amount of evidence consistent with this, which doesn't mean it's the only thing that's out there, or, or that it's absolutely true, it just means it's a useful model so far. Cher's biopsychosocial model is is a model that says that there are three pathways and it's not necessarily the case that each child could only be susceptible to one but I think in general we think of children as being only in one of the pathways three pathways to and through substance use like problematic substance use now these are not brain pathways or anything this is pathways through life like a conceptual pathway a way you could get involved in in this kind of stuff and then uh, continue involved in it. The first is the enhanced reinforcement path pathway. Now, as a psychologist, I'm looking at this enhanced reinforcement. Reinforcement's a behavioral thing, right? Enhanced reinforcement? Well, I happen to know from other research, and I am fairly certain that Cher is aware of this as well, that one of the characteristics of ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, is an increased sensitivity to reward reinforcement. And so the genetic risk is almost certainly going to involve genetic effects that reduce your ability to inhibit your behavior. And so people with ADHD are probably one of the groups of people who, who have the genetic risk in shares biopsychosocial enhanced reinforcement pathway. You have a genetic risk. So the diathesis stress model, this is the diathesis diathesis I can't write very well with this tablet thing I'm I, my handwriting's bad anyway but it's quite terrible here um, so then you have positive expectations of effects so if you have a genetic risk and you are raised to believe that substance use effects will be positive well, those expectation effects, and there's lots of research on alcohol and drug expectation effects, your expectations have a decent amount to do with the experience you have with alcohol and drugs. It's not the only thing, but they affect it. So if you have positive expectations, so this is going to make me feel good, this is going to be awesome, this is how successful people do things, my uncle's awesome, he does things this way, yeah, that girl over there smoking that thing, oh, she's the baddest, I want to be like her. Um, so if you have a genetic risk plus positive expectations, then you are at enhanced statistical risk for developing problem use. Now, another pathway he has is the stress and negative affect pathway. Now, think about this. Enhanced reinforcement. He doesn't say specifically that this is the case, but um, this is going to be largely focusing on people with externalizing disorders or characteristics that might be disorders if they were more severe. Now, here, stress negative affect so negative affect means negative mood I know technically affect means the external expression of your feelings and your mood but a lot of times in research situations we just use affect to mean feelings and mood so stress and bad mood this is the stress and bad mood pathway this is the dark side of the force pathway plus a whole lot of anxiety right so um, this pathway suggests that alcohol use is a coping mechanism to deal with stress and negative feelings and that you get negative reinforcement. Now remember, reinforcement means that a behavior, there's a consequence. I'm going to make like a starry type thing here, like kaboom, a consequence happened. And now the behavior is more likely. That's reinforcement. Well, the consequence can be 
adding something to your life or subtracting something to your life, but it's reinforcement if this happens, if the behavior is more likely afterwards. Well, negative reinforcement is when usually when something unpleasant gets taken away. Well, a lot of people drink or do drugs so they don't have to think about how lousy their life is so they can stop stressing about uh, the things in their life that they can't stop feeling stress about. So this is also going to have a genetic component to it because anxiety proneness is a big deal, genetically speaking. It's, it's strongly genetically driven for many people. So uh, there's... Uh, his pathway he suggests here is that some people get involved in alcohol use because they're self-medicating. Well, self-medicating once or twice is just self-medicating. Self-medicating 30 or 40 times in a row has had this negative reinforcement thing going on. It has become a pattern. And this is actually part of addiction. The behavioral elements, the behaviorist, the, the reinforcement and punishment elements of, the, of addiction are actually according to some research, every bit as powerful as the strongly, the purely directly biological. I mean, reinforcement is biological too, but it's environmental as well. So people, people here and people here, they're going to have very different experiences. These people are using alcohol because they think it's going to be fun or other drugs. I go to raves. It's awesome. These people are using alcohol and drugs because their life is not fun and this is the way that they reduce that non-funness. They take their mind off it or they make it not so bad for a little while. And then finally, you have the deviance prone pathway. And remember those, um, those pipelines that we had for, you know, ADHD and then or oppositional defiant disorder, ADHD, etc. So those pathways, that's what we're looking at here. Deviance prone pathways. You're going to have rejection by pro-social, meaning the peers who get along with people, the peers who... Uh, are not rejected by everybody. Rejection by the kind of peers, the kind of friends your mom wants you to have. And instead you have association with deviant peers. Now these are not going to be independent because this right here, remember this has all the hallmarks. I mean, the research is going to show that this has some ADHD stuff going on here. And the research is going to show that this has some like conduct disorder stuff going on here. And we know those things are strongly associated with deviance proneness, with rejection by the kinds of kids your mom wants you to be friends with, and the only people who will hang out with you are the kids who your mom really doesn't want you to be friends with. So this is, these are the three pathways. Um, I don't know, I sometimes think of this just in a sloppy way as like ADHD thrill-seeking-ish kind of thing. Um, this one is like anxiety self-medicating type thing, and then the third one is I got thrown in with uh, the bad kids behind the school, and so that's why I started using alcohol and drugs, etc. Now, ditching that, we need to talk briefly about how public health people talk about prevention. It's not psychology, but all sorts of fields, including psychology, use these, term these terms a lot. We have preventive strategies. Now, usually you'll hear primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention. These are these are ways to classify the things people do in public health to try and ameliorate problems. <coughs> now, if you're thinking prevention is just something that happens before the problem happens, well, that, that definition is weird. And public health prevention sometimes also includes things you do after the problem has already started, so more like treatment. Anyway, the primary, secondary, tertiary thing is pretty common. Um, this little thing I got here suggests that in public health, like CDC and stuff like that, that, that for the past few years they've been using this thing that's called primordial. I think that used to be primary. Anyway, these two things are often lumped together. So if you, if you, have a, if you decide that you're going to reduce alcohol use by just sending cops into schools all over America and telling the kids don't do drugs, okay, then you're following one of these strategies. Now, it's, that's pretty much a general population strategy, but if you chose maybe high schools where there were high rates of alcohol use, then that would be more like a primary prevention strategy. So it could be primordial or primary. The primordial thing is kind of new. This all used to be called primary. Anyway, um, well, kind of divided because some of this was secondary too. They've kind of shaken it up a bit. Now, primary strategies, a primary prevention strategy would be if you go into 
only the schools where you have where you suspect that there's a lot of people susceptible to this stuff like you've noticed that this certain school has really high levels of alcohol use or you only call the kids in for the special you know alcohol prevention strategy thing whatever you're doing this isn't about what strategy you use or what what you tell the kids or what you do this is about which people you target so this is uh, which subsets of the population that you target so if you're looking at people who are who are susceptible to the problem and for statistically you know that they have a higher risk so you just call in the kids who have been called into the principal's office at least once for substance use and you have a thing with them so yeah that's primary prevention secondary prevention that used to be secondary. Anyway, sec secondary prevention is the people who have the problem but are not showing it strongly. At least that's the new version of secondary prevention. This used to be secondary. This. They keep changing this every, every decade or so, and it just got caught up on the last decade. So secondary prevention is more, uh, I guess these days, targeting people who have the problem. So people who have alcohol use problems, but it hasn't started to trash their lives. They haven't started failing in school and alienating their friends and family and stuff yet. They're leaving in their arbeit and haven't fallen asleep. So they, we could call them asymptomatic. They're not showing the symptoms yet, but they have the problems. And then tertiary prevention is your last ditch effort. It's the people who are showing all the problems and they're at risk for having all the terrible outcomes and you get involved with them. So psychotherapy, but you can do various things at different points along the way. Um, this is a model overall, and you can see that it's applied to physical uh, diseases as well, right? But, well, it's based on the idea of physical diseases, but it gets involved in a public health way with psychological and behavioral problems a lot. Now, a primary prevention, although these days they might say primordial, a primary prevention initiative that most people know about is DARE. But these primary prevention initiatives, um, you go into large groups of people, you're not selecting them by, you're at high risk, you're at higher risk. No, you're just everybody you're thinking we'll just get the messages out to everybody you're making tv commercials you're putting up billboards you're going into all the schools and you're trying to change people's attitudes about uh drugs and alcohol now if you're going to do a research study and you want to make sure you have a, a good outcome don't measure whether you actually changed things like behaviors just measure whether you changed attitudes because attitudes change a lot easier than behaviors do. Well, there's a lot of research early on in the D.A.R.E. program and things like that in the 80s and 90s showing that, wow, kids' attitudes towards drugs changed quite a lot. But it turns out that didn't do anything for the actual substance use. That doesn't mean changing the attitudes doesn't matter. It's just that the, the attitude change that we saw from D.A.R.E. was not indicating an actual change in substance use itself. D.A.R.E. is largely ineffective in general. I think the research is pretty clear that it has been a lot of wasted time and effort. It increased people's awareness of problems, so there's probably some secondary effects, like parents and teachers are more aware of the problems that can exist. It probably forged some great partnerships between police departments and elementary and high schools, but it doesn't seem to have changed anybody's substance use patterns. Um, secondary prevention is when you target people who are at high risk. You're not just getting the general population, you're targeting the high risk people. There are some mixed results from this. And, and this is this is when you're going to do interventions with kids, this is adolescence again, with kids who have been identified as being at high risk either because they have alcoholism in their family, because they're being abused and neglected, because they're with deviant peers, anything that's a statistical high risk, or more directly, and this is probably the most common thing, because they have started to use alcohol and drugs at ages that we hope kids wouldn't start to do that yet. So you get mixed results. It's not as amazing as we had hoped. Some of the best results come when you target multiple risk factors. So you target people who have a genetic risk factor, a family behavior risk factor, like someone in the family is alcoholic or somebody in the family went to you know, drug court or something like that. And also they have been called to the principal's office once for, for maybe having a bottle of vodka in their backpack. So as we've seen before, just kind of like with multisystemic therapy, if you have, you know, the full court press, if, you, if you're looking at people who have lots and lots of different characteristics of a problem, those are the people who are most likely to have the problem, for sure. So your effectiveness will be better if you work with them and you kind of reduce the effects of that problem. Uh, if you have a mixed group of people who have serious problems and people who have less serious problems, it's harder to show, inter show improvement. That's one of the things that's going on here. So target people with multiple risk factors because they are the ones who are m much more likely to have 
uh, alcohol abuse problems. And the, the best programs teach skills to avoid substance use, not just substance use is bad. That does not tell you how to avoid substance use. And skills to develop positive peer relationships. Anybody who's been through a serious substance abuse program knows that substance abuse is not just, or just use, is not just about somebody peer pressured you into doing it. If you've been doing it a while, it's about emotions, it's about your coping strategies in your life. It fills some space in your life, and you've got to figure out something else to fill that space if you're going to stop using it. Um, it exploits any kind of vulnerability or weakness that you might have that otherwise wouldn't be a problem, but now that you, now that substances are involved, now you're the fact that you like to say yes to people, which is normally a good thing, becomes a bad thing because now to help get along with people, you're doing heroin with them or whatever. Um, so some of the in interventions that are out there. So this is at what, po what, at what point or what group of people do we target the interventions? So most of these interventions are going to be like secondary or especially tertiary prevention. So tertiary prevention is you've got a problem let's fix it so prevention I've, I've never understood why you have to call that a kind of oh a kind of prevention once you've got the problem I'm not sure what you're preventing the problems there anyway 12-step programs have been around forever Alcoholics Anonymous Narcotics Anonymous etc there's lots of anonymouses they conceptualize addiction as a disease uh, which is probably a pretty good way to conceptualize it rather than addiction is you're a shitty person or you have no self-control because those aren't helpful. They're probably not true. They also don't help the problem. Okay. And they have some inter other interesting assumptions like in the traditional alcohol and Alcoholics Anonymous, you can't really be atheist. You've got to acknowledge that there's a higher power in the universe. Um, uh, so you've got to acknowledge that there's like, you know, a God or something like that. I keep doing this. Um, that's, that's my higher power. They have a halo, whoever they are. Uh, you've got to admit that you will always be an addict, you know, forever and ever. Well, and like I said, the research doesn't necessarily support that, but okay, fine. If it helps you, fine. They're somewhat effective. Maybe the evidence for them is extremely weak. And in randomized controlled trials where you randomly assign people, some people go to 12-step programs, some people go to other programs, and you control for dropouts, which is complicated. You've got all these people who start your study, and they go through the study, but then this person drops out here, and these people go through the study, you know, and this person drops out here, and these are the only people who end. And then at the end, you just measure them. Well, what happened to these people? It's a big question in statistics and data analysis and research methods. What you do with those people can totally change the view of a study. And in general, you have to do something. You have to figure out why they dropped out, and you have to analyze things differently. You can't just say, oh, these people improved. Well, maybe they improved because they had easier problems to deal with. Maybe you lost all the people who had tough problems, which is a big, a big con concern in these kinds of re uh, research studies. So with adolescents, it might reduce impulsivity a little bit which is kind of nice and but overall it's not the most effective model it is the most common model so there are a lot of people trying to make make it work trying to work with AA and NA people around the country and around the world because it's everywhere and so if you can't find any other program you can find this and they tend to be free which is nice because who has health insurance that can afford behavioral addiction treatment not so many people so the cognitive behavioral therapy model um, operant and classical conditioning and social learning is moderately effective. Now you can go pure cognitive when you're just working on people's thoughts and their treatment cycles, and that's the most common. I believe it's more effective when you have people working on operant and classical conditioning. One way people do that is, you know, you got, let me just describe that. You got your friends. I, I knew a guy who did this work. Do you know what ant abuse is? It's not abusing your relatives. It's a chemical, little blue it's a little chemical that's a pill you can't even oh i can't even draw pills it's a pill you take and then while it's in your system which tends to last a day or two <coughs> or so i have heard then if you drink alcohol you become violently ill some people are so sensitive when their are abuse is in their system that if they are near someone with perfume they will throw up violently ill like retching your guts out in a gutter for 10 minutes like it's so bad so <laughs> one model of um alcohol uh, treatment is you you have somebody you know at the beginning of the night 
you take a pill and you don't know if it's oops you don't know if it's the ant abuse pill or if it's a placebo pill because the therapist has both kinds and they look and taste identical evil therapist you take one of them and then you go to Le Bar There's a tawdry little window as the door. You go in the bar, and then you're in there with all your friends, and you listen to your music, and you do some little dancing or whatever you do. This person's getting wild. And then you drink, and you drink. You drink hard and fast, and it takes usually less than a minute, I think, for the ant abuse to hit. So you don't know if you're about to take a drink and it's okay, or if you're about to take a drink and be the sickest you've ever been. And if you're sick, you go back in the alley and then you, you, you retch your guts out uh, in the alley, and then you go back in and your therapist makes you drink again until you can't stand it and you're crying and you have to go home. Um, and every time you go out, you don't know if you're going to have this terrible experience or this okay experience. It bill, it conditions. It's a random punishment. We don't talk much about random punishment schedules and behaviorism, but this is a random punishment schedule. There are less draconian ways of doing this, but this is one of the hardcore ways that people, like true behaviorists, do uh, alcohol treatment. This is, tends to be a lot more effective, is my understanding, than just talking about your thoughts and your feelings. And Okay, it's not just that. Let's talk briefly about... Uh, cognitive cognitive therapy. So cognitive therapy without the behavior, without the B, you talk about uh, what you always talk about in cognitive therapy. You talk about an activating event, and then and then um, how that interacts with some negative beliefs you might have, and then the consequence that you may have, like this ABC type thing. So you talk with people about their particular specific activating events, the, and you work with them through therapy. It usually takes a few weeks, but not a ton, like five, ten weeks, which isn't a lot in therapy to help people identify their particular problematic beliefs about alcohol and social life and celebration and fun and friends and love and all that stuff. It's all wrapped up usually with alcohol use and self-esteem always. Um, and you talk about how these things proceed and you talk about how you can break the cycle. This is moderately effective, not amazingly effective, definitely better than AA, but almost everything is better than AA. Anyway, um, another kind of thing that people do in cognitive therapy is they look at just the costs and benefits. It's a very rational approach. Nothing to see behind the curtain. Let's just talk about this. This is how we do this. It's very straight ahead. It's great because pretty much everybody gets it and they get on board with it. It makes sense. And if something makes sense, people are going to do it. And since it is moderately effective, that's one of the reasons it's moderately effective is because people actually do it. They, they work through this because it makes sense to them. There's no mystery. There's no like woo-woo therapist who has to secretly interpret your dreams or whatever. It's just this is the way things work. Let's look at the research. The therapy sessions sometimes seem more like classes than sessions. Now, I can tell you having worked in substance abuse treatment sometimes, the therapy sessions in group sessions, which I've, I've done this for several months when I was on internship and in grad school, you get groups of people ordered by the court to go through substance use treatment, and often the people running the substance use treatment will claim it's CBT. But in my experience, many of them don't really know what CBT is. They're following a manual, which is good, so it's harder to make mistakes. But they don't really understand much about the dynamics of how to work with somebody's, somebody as they're getting to know like their, their thoughts and their feelings and their beliefs and, and their personal cycles of of uh, substance abuse, etc. So um, it's kind of this big racket. It's not just a racket. It's a huge business. Therapy companies, some of which don't actually have therapists. They just have people who, like, I don't know, have an associate's degree in something and took a six weeks training course, course, doing substance use treatment for the courts. And they contract, and whoever owns the company makes a decent amount of money. And they probably do more good than harm, but honestly, it's very watered down from what I've seen, and it's rare to find really effective therapy going on there. If you find somebody who actually knows how to do CBT and delivers CBT in the way that it's, that's consistent with the principles of CBT um, and is skilled in doing it, then it's probably going to be a lot more effective. Now, another 
thing that we need to learn about before we learn about the next thing is the stages of change model. This is a trans-theoretical model of therapy. It's not a model of therapy per se, it's a model of how people get to the point where they're ready to change. So it's a model of how people develop a motivation to change. It doesn't tell you how to do the change, it just tells you how to get to where you're ready to change. So if you're working with one within a stages of change model, you, your, your goal is to assess where a client is in the stages of change and move to the next stage. So let's look at those things. The stages of change model says that there are five different stages. Pre-contemplation um, is when you don't recognize that any change needs to happen and you have no interest in changing, like you haven't even thought about it. So if you have an alcohol problem and people say, you have a problem and you're like, what? No, I don't. Go away. Contemplation is when you're thinking, perhaps there's a problem here, and maybe someday I'll do something about it. Now, moving from here to here is a big deal, because the preparation stage is when you start to get ready to change. And people, and one of the nice things about the stages of change model is it highlights the fact that it's not always going to work when you just drag someone off the streets and say, let's have therapy for your addiction. Because they might be somewhere up here, and you're going to get nowhere with them. People do go through like a process before they decide that they're ready to make any changes in their lives. So when you get from the contemplation stage to the preparation stage, now you're mentally doing something, at least. Now you're kind of beginning to commit to the idea that, you, that something needs to be done, and you might be going to do it. it, it it's going to be what you do. Now the action phase, this is an important transition, but I think most people recognize its transition to get people to go from preparation to action. Action is when you say, all right, now I'm marching down to that clinic on the street and I'm going in the front door and saying, I wanna talk to somebody about my alcohol problem. Now, and then maintenance, as in many things, the long term is where things can fall apart. So the maintenance phase, after you've taken action, the novelty of it wears off, the initial gains aren't as exciting and dramatic anymore. Now it's just walking that long, long walk, and this is where a lot of things fall apart. Alcohol and drug uh, relapse happen, but as AA says, relapse is part of the process. I mean, the relapse happens, you get back on the wagon, that's what you do. But the maintenance phase lasts for a very, very long time. But the stages of change model, there's a kind of therapy, I'm not sure we should be calling it therapy, 10, 15 years ago, they didn't even call it this. They just called it, they called it motivational interviewing. And most people said, this isn't really a therapy. It's not that fancy. Well, now it's called motivational enhancement therapy. Okay, fine. You get to call it a therapy. It's based on the stages of change model. So uh, there is some evidence for its effectiveness in certain ways. It's extremely cost effective. You can train non-therapists to do this fairly well with a, with a couple of weeks of training. You can get people who are maybe sort of quasi-natural helpers, you can get them up to speed to where they're pretty good at motivational interviewing. Okay, MET, whatever. It's probably best used with another therapy because this stuff moves you through the stages of change. This therapy is to move you through the stages of change to where you're ready to take action and then later maintenance. And so in the action, that's where you do the therapy. So you can say, you know, put your therapy in this box here, CBT, I don't know, behavioral therapy, I don't know, multisystemic therapy, I don't know, interpersonal therapy, right? So motivational th enhancement therapy. Um, motivational interviewing m is a way of helping people move, usually within just a couple of weeks, sometimes a little longer, sometimes faster moving people towards where they're ready to make changes. And then usually at some point you bring in people who are good at a certain kind of therapy to make the change, or you, or you train the therapists in motivational interviewing, which is even more effective. Um, the principles of motivational interviewing, this isn't going to be shocking to you. It actually fits nicely with the business world. It's sort of the way the business world kinds of thinks about things. So you develop you work with the client to see a discrepancy between their goals and their current behavior. Because sometimes people rationalize and don't realize that if they keep drinking, they're not going to finish college, right? So help them realize that there's a problem with achieving their goals if they keep doing their behavior. And overall, you don't argue. Now this is just a generally good therapy tactic, in my opinion. Don't argue. Arguing, okay, I argue a lot on the internet, but and I argue with students sometimes. I've been known to argue with lots of people. But in therapy, I tried very hard not to because if you're actually trying to change the way somebody thinks and behaves, argument almost never does it. It gets resistance going and then people have a very hard time changing. 
So you roll with the resistance, you go with it. It's judo, not karate, you know. Um, you express empathy, warmth, and concern through active listening, and you support the client's efforts to change no matter how small. Now, this is important because a lot of the messages that we get in our life suggest that you need a big change or else no one's going to validate that. Yeah, the rain's getting loud again, so I better wrap this up. And you acknowledge success wherever you can. In fact, you are desperately looking for success and you help the client see that there's been a success. Like you estimate the number of drinks they've taken every week or they are, or you have them report uh, back every week of you know what challenges that they that they tackled and and you try and find success because this is positive reinforcement and this is self-efficacy the cloth in the background makes the colors very strange sorry about that anyway let me just remind you that for some reason I brought a bunch of booze out here and it's not just so that I can sit in my dome and drink after this lecture's over, because I've got things to do. I've got to go do some office hours. I brought a cup that doesn't actually have any coffee in it, because coffee's just super gross. I don't really have it around. So anyway, and somehow my elephant tusk cravat decoration went astray. All right, until next time, this is the end.